welcome to the afternoon session of the second day for the Open Education Symposium. Um, this is the zero textbook cost panel. Um, and my name is Wiley Strobert. I'm a, a faculty member in the uh, mechanical engineering department at the University of Alberta. Um, and I will introduce our panel. Um, so we have uh, a, a good sized panel for this discussion. Um, we have Karsten Lopelman from the University of Alberta, uh, Chetan Jessel from the, uh, from the University of Calgary, Aruj Nizami from Kwantlen Polytechnic University. Uh, and hopefully joining us at some point will be Verena Roberts from Thompson Rivers University, Brenda Smith also from Thompson Rivers University. Yes, Sona uh, McNaughton from Red Deer Polytechnic, uh, and Caitlin Radcliffe, also from Red Deer Polytechnic. And uh, last but certainly not least, Anne Ludbrook from Ryerson University. The last thing is to uh, the, the moderator of this session is uh, Robel Ngonga, um, and I will turn it over to, to him uh, to lead the, the rest of the session. Thank you for the introductions, Wiley. Uh, and as mentioned, I'll be the facilitator for this uh, discussion today. Um, as this is a zero textbook cost uh, panel, I guess it's more, it, it makes, uh, it would be good to start off with the first question. And that is, what does ZTC look like at your respective institutions? Um, I know this is a, a, a new concept for some of us, but I'd like to hear what it looks like at different institutions. And to start us off, I will ask Karsten from the University of Alberta to go first. So, I'd like to show you the range of ZTC options that exist. So I've done a few over the past five years. Uh, I have done an OER textbook replacement. So this is a complete replacement for a commercial textbook. Uh, absolutely zero cost. Although there was a print version available, and that really surprised me that about a quarter of my class opted for the print version of a free online textbook. So they were willing and able to shell out, I think it was about 50 to $55 for this print edition. I'm not sure why they did that. This was a first year class. Maybe they figured this is what you do in university. You pay lots of money for books, or maybe they just prefer reading on paper. Um, I suppose they could have printed out the OER, but that would have been a lot of paper. But there are other options besides full textbook replacements. So for example, this semester, I'm using a course pack. So I've curated readings, which include um, some book chapters and research articles, and I put them together into a course pack. The uh, Copyright Office here at the University of Alberta has been absolutely fantastic about getting clearance for those. Unfortunately, there was one book chapter that they couldn't get, and I wanted to go full zero. So um, on very short notice, I picked another reading and uh, I used that instead of that. So it was actually a completely zero cost option. So these first two are probably pretty familiar with people. There was a third option that really surprised me. Um, you can put textbooks on reserve in libraries, of course, but the uh, University of Alberta Library was able to get some licenses for eBooks for some of my textbooks. So it's very limited, only six copies can be checked out at one time, um, but this does open things up to people quite a lot, especially if we're in the remote situation and the library is closed down. So it's kind of technically a zero cost. Um, in practicality, it's probably not qualifying for that. I do have 262 students and there's only six copies of the ebook, so they'll have to, to fight over that. But there still are a number of different options that you could go when it comes to zero textbook cost for your course. Yes, and thank you, Carson, for sharing the range of options that uh, you have explored and come across. At this point, I'd also like to hear from Verena and Brenda. Uh, Verena and Brenda, sorry. Uh, what does the ZTC look like at your institution? Hello. I'm uh, Dr. Verena Roberts, and I'm um, with TRU as an instructional designer. So specifically, we have two different ways of thinking about ZTC programs at TRU. And I'm going to talk about specifically the open learning, um, uh, I would say, version <laughs> or consideration when we think about ZTC. 
So um, for us, it requires a lot of administrative support to determine which courses, which pathway, and, and realizing that it's not just about press books and textbooks. For example, we had to change our software infrastructure, things like adapting and creating TRU specific press books for all our OL programs because OL is open learning and it is asynchronous online course delivery. We also had to do things like learn about latex, splots, web work integration and connection with Moodle, for example, joining the ADAPT open homework system and the LibreText open community. Um, we actually had to think about professional development to support educational technologists and instructional designers and um, subject matter experts to support the multiple available mediums of open educational resources. I just want to emphasize for us, it's not just about adapting and linking to a press book or a current open um, textbook. Every course in the Assist Associative Science program has been different. And this helps us to prepare to do this in multiple areas and the future of open educational resources. Brenda, can I take it away. <laughs> So we have sort of, as, as Rena was saying, is that the campus way of open doing ZTC and the um, open learning is a little bit different. On the campus institution, I mean, there's the two programs that we're, we're working on in open learning, but in campus, we don't have any designated ZTC programs at this time, but we do have a lot of individual courses. Uh, in fall 2021, we had 435 classes that were ZTC. And um, the way it's done right now is it's either an individual faculty member to have their course be ZTC, or sometimes it's a departmental decision. And some courses like our first year accounting class, all the sections are ZTC because the department decided as a group that that's what they were gonna do. Others like our first year English composition course, only some sections are because it depends on the faculty member whether they decided to do that. So students can get a ZTC program uh, via open learning by taking campus-based courses. So for example, our, our certificate in general education, which is our ZTC designated program that we um, developed for BC campus, you can do all OL courses to do that, or you can actually do campus versions, depending on who's teaching the courses, to actually do that. Um, students can get an idea about um, which courses are going to be ZTC because all ZTC courses are marked in the banner registration system so that they know upfront when they're registering for a course, whether that course section is actually going to be ZTC. So that's sort of a snapshot of what's happening at TRU. Thank you so much, Brigina and Brenda, for the in-depth uh, uh, discussion you've just had and, this, and sharing what it looks like at your institution. I'd also like to hear from Uruj. Uh, what does ZTC look like at, at KPU? Sure. So a lot of what my colleagues have said is true for KPU as well. So KPU is home to Canada's first ZTC program and was spearheaded by Rajiv Jangiani. And we launched in 2018 and very soon after, aided by a partnership um, with partnering across schools and faculties, as, as well as the Office of the Registrar, ZTC was added as a course attribute, allowing for students to search um, the course timetable by ZTC section. So just like Brenda just said is true for TRU. Um, so as it stands, we have eight programs that students can go through without ever having to take um, a class that requires a textbook. So in, a, in an academic year, we have just about 800 sections that are classified as ZTC. And since the inception of the program, we've saved students about $8 million from our calculations. Um, also, like my colleague said, this has been paired with professional development opportunities for faculty. So we really partner with the library and the Center for Teaching and Learning to get um, instructors to the point where they can be what we call ZTC ready so that they can link within Moodle, which is our uh, learning management system to, to resources. And like my colleagues have said, our program depends not only on open educational resources only, but also on library licensed materials, also on freely available materials online and materials created by instructors. Thank you, Rouge. It does sound like you have a very extensive program, and I'm, I'm sure all of us in attendance today are very happy to learn more about it. Uh, but uh, the more the merrier. So I'll ask Sonia to go ahead as well. 
Thank you. Uh, so myself, as well as Caitlin, my colleague on the call, we are both librarians. Uh, and so I'll speak to the library-led initiative of adding the ZTC indicator to our timetable at Red Deer Polytechnic. So we, of course, wanted um, students to be able to know up front that they're registering for courses that have a zero textbook cost. Uh, and our um, implementation was inspired, actually, by KPU. And uh, KPU shared their processes in uh, an OER, actually. I've just popped it into um, the chat. Um, and so our project started in January 2021, so it's fairly recent. And at the time, there was another existing initiative on campus happening to streamline textbook reporting. And we were lucky to piggyback on that and rebrand it as ZTC. So ultimately, this resulted in us being able to have the ZTC indicator added as a course attribute in Banner, which is our student information system. And so by May of uh, 21, the indicator was added to 778 sections, so about 28% of all of our RDP course sections. Um, and of those, 21% were lecture sections. So what we're hoping to do is really significantly increase the number of these lecture sections in the upcoming timetable um, as we streamline our processes. We really want this information to be transparent for students when they are registering. Uh, currently, students can't search our timetable for the ZTC marker. Um, however, when they search for a course section, they'll see the ZTC no-cost icon as part of course information. And we did conduct a limited survey of students' uh, perceptions of our ZTC indicator. Uh, and the majority of the students surveyed were um, really enthusiastic for this attribute, which is awesome. And 75% responded that um, the presence of the attribute would influence their choice. So we're really excited to get it more widespread. So yeah, thank you. I'd also like to ask Chetan to go ahead. I, I, I do have a feeling that you'd have an interesting contribution, so I, I'll leave it to you. Um, everybody's talk about, talked about all these incredible successes they've had with, with ZTC um, at their own home institutions. But at the University of Calgary, we don't actually have that large of a, I guess, a ZTC culture um, that's, that's built up um, across you know, various faculties and, and whatnot. To date, all the ZTC work that's being done are classes that are offering, you know, learning resources that are, you know, you don't have to pay a lot for. That's, that's coming from like a ground up level. It's coming from like bottom up. And there's nothing like from a top down perspective that's enforcing people to do this or not enforcing, but like suggesting it and pushing um, the idea of ZTC onto professors and to instructors. That's a really, really interesting, like, that's like, I'm also coming at this from like a student's perspective. Because like I know that I've talked to a lot of professors about like you know the like in the classes that haven't uh, that have been using like an open education resource, and a lot of them don't even really you know know what open education resources are. They're just using these resources because they compiled them themselves, and you know they they threw them online and and they think they're better than what else is out there. So I think it's really really interesting that at the UFC um, we're kind of still developing like again the OER culture and the culture of open. But there are still professors that are doing this work, um, despite the fact that, like, you know, it is just, <laughs> you know, on their own volition. And they might even not know, might not even know that they're actually pushing ZTC or pushing open education. So I think that's a, it's an interesting perspective. And um, I think, I think that just shows like how willing professors are like all across campus to, to engage in things that, you know, do really help students learn and also, you know, reduce costs for students. So. Um, also, I'd like to hear from Anne from Ryerson. What does ZTC look like at your institution? Yeah, so we're actually in a similar situation to um, uh, Chatton at University of um, Calgary. I actually tried to work on a ZCred program where we had a certificate program with the distance learning um, uh, department at Ryerson, and it was quite challenging. We got every single course except one ZTC, but we couldn't actually make it for that final one because they were relying on a textbook and the instructor was not willing to give up the um, textbook. So what happens is, is ultimately it is up to the instructor. So the instructors have to buy into it. And I do think that top-down um, situation um, is possibly 
what does help um, because that I was definitely as a librarian doing a grassroots approach where I was trying to um, use already existing e-reserve courses that were completely open and then trying to transfer a bunch of those over to open courses and we did transfer most of the certificate but not the entire thing and it does say that sort of having that um, back and forth conversation with um, a program head who understands the intention that's behind it is really um, important because um, uh, we weren't successful. What I did do was I ended up out of the experience writing um, a a zero textbook cost um, booklet um, for how to do it. And um, Rajiv was kind enough to actually review that. Um, So I do have that document, but we basically now, we really focus on trying to do as many e-reserve courses. So it's completely free. Our e-reserve courses are completely free to students. We do copyright permission for business cases. We do all kinds of things like that. And we're using our e-reserve um, program to help advance towards a ZTC, but we still are not in a situation where we've had enough buy-in from faculty who are willing for the for because we have obstacle courses that are required and um, you can't it's it's up to the faculty member to um, to sort of decide to not use the textbook so similar situation and um, for you for places that have been successful it it shows um, how much the instructors have been involved in that process Yes, that is true, Anne. And one thing I'll say is a journey of a thousand miles does start with one step. So it is encouraging to see that at least uh, initiatives have been taken, but it does bring us back to the main to, to the second question I'd like to ask all panelists, panelists today, is what's the biggest challenge you've, uh, you've, you've come across or instructors have come across at your institution when it comes to implementing ZTC? And I know you've touched a bit on this, but would you like to expand further on some of the challenges you might have come across at your institution? Yeah, so I think that in terms of the course marking, um, it's really great if you you really need top down um, uh, you need top down support to actually be able to liaise and get traction on doing your course marking because I did um, also contact and try to start the process of getting course markings and it was very hard. I was sort of saying, well, who will help authorize this? Who is you know um, we haven't ever had this kind of request before. There were a lot of obstacles that way. And I would say that um, I talked to everyone I thought I needed to talk to, but then realized that there was someone I hadn't. And that was the um, chair of the department. And they ultimately were the ones that that, um, sort of went against the idea and didn't understand what the problem was about having a textbook. So I do think that you really need to talk to all the stakeholders in a project when you're trying to do it and make sure that you do have some top-down commitments towards it because because I didn't have that, I couldn't um, meet that. I think that now, maybe a few years later, I could probably go back to that instructor because we worked together on another project, making something open, which made me think, okay, so now maybe she would be um, more open to it. It's just the pandemic hit and that changed things. But I do think that maybe it's a process for certain people to learn more about open and to learn more about the obstacles um, for, of, of textbook purchasing, especially for certificate programs. Yes, that is true. It is a process, I do agree. And there must be willingness on all ends of, by all parties involved for a successful program to take off. Um, Chetan, if I may turn to you as well, um, uh, same question. What are some of the biggest challenges instructors at the University of Cal- Calgary have come across in terms of going ZTC? From my own discussions with a bunch of professors and from talking with librarians as well, it kind of is the, I guess in the past, um, it has kind of been the lack of, again, top-down support and kind of um, suggestion to adopt open education and like ZTC um, into their classes. But along with that, one of the struggles that, um, and I'll happily announce that it's been, like there's work being done to, to resolve this, but it's been the lack of like resources that professors could go to to discuss open education resources and to, you know, have the support. We have some wonderful, absolutely wonderful librarians that are really passionate about open education and and everything that goes with that. Um, The unfortunate thing is that, you know, when a librarian has like a thousand different tasks to do every single day, sometimes, you know, some things aren't, you know, like (laughs) they can't prioritize everything to a hundred percent, right? 
So one of the really, really exciting things that the University of Calgary did recently was hire a full-time uh, um, open education resource librarian, which I personally think can make a really, really big difference in helping to you know, prioritize open education resources and, and implement ZTC into classes and um, hopefully after that into programs. So um, that's some of the exciting challenge. I guess that's a challenge that did exist that we're trying, trying our best uh, to resolve at the U of C. Thank you so much for sharing that, Jason, and it's, it is encouraging to hear. Uh, and at this point, I'd also like to hear from some of the universities or some of the representatives we had on our panel that had a, I'd say, that had, that spoke about some of the successful ZTC programs they've had at the institutions. Uh, would any of, of us on the panel today like to share some of the challenges, challenges we might have faced implementing ZTC or getting to the point uh, we have it at now at our various institutions? Go ahead, um, Brenda. Yeah, one thing I wanted to say is that one of the challenges that we've had in building actual ZTC programs is the, it's been kind of talked about before, but it's the whole idea that faculty have the academic freedom to choose what teaching resources they want to use. So it can be that a prof can have a ZTC course one semester, but not the next, because maybe it wasn't the experience they thought, or maybe the prof that's been registered that there was a course that was ZTC, but then someone else was assigned to teach that course and they choose not to continue with it. So I think the sustainability is can sometimes be a challenge, which is why I think we've had more success with it and the open learning ones because individual faculty don't choose resources in the same way. But I think for individual faculty, one of the barriers that they have for going ZTC is the perception of time. I also think that for a lot of them, the barrier can be the lack of ancillary resources like case studies, test banks, homework systems. And then another one that we've discovered <laughs> is that it can also be that there's the OER, there we find an OER and it is an OER, but it's not really easily remixable based on the platform that they've done. So sometimes that can be a bit of a challenge, but I do wanna give a shout out to Anne because we are actually at TRU taking her ZTC toolkit that she created and we're adapting it for what we need here at TRU. So yay, Anne. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Brenda. And it is good to see that we're all working together in all ways because uh, together we are stronger than uh, as individuals. But yes, uh, Caitlin, I did see you also wanted to contribute, so feel free to go ahead. Thank you. Yes, uh, although I'm afraid I'll just be reiterating what Anne and Brenda have already said. Um, I'm very sympathetic to the concerns or the issues that Anne ran into because we are having some of those very similar conversations at our institutions as well. Um, we're finding... Uh, we're having trouble with um, this perception of time that Brenda mentioned, that instructors do feel like they don't have the time necessary to convert courses uh, away from publisher resources. Um, and also, as Brenda mentioned, um, struggling to find those kind of ancillary resources like the homework management systems has been a challenge as well. Thank you so much, Caitlin. I'll turn to Sona. Um, is there any challenge you'd like to share with us? Any unique challenge that might have not been part of the conversation so far? I think Caitlin has summed up, uh, I think the biggest challenges that we've uh, faced with implementing uh, OER and ZTC. Thank you. No problem, that is fair. With that, I think we've had a very comprehensive discussion on the challenges, but it's also good to hear why we would, or what we would recommend for instructors to move or to, to implement as they try to move their courses to ZTC. I think it's one thing to mention the challenges, but it's also good to try work on ways that we can overcome some of these challenges. To start off the conversation on the recommendations we'd have for instructors, um, Verena, would you like to kick us off with this? I'm actually going to get Brenda to start and I will follow her if that's okay. <laughs> um, I would say that one of the things you need to do is just start small and then you can get fancier and deeper over time for individual faculty. Maybe it starts with just adopting a textbook as is, and then maybe adding some minor adaptations like switching the order of chapters or changing images or changing examples, and then maybe looking at adding case studies or and then looking at adding test banks, then look at adding some H5P interactions. I would say don't try and do it all at once because you get overwhelmed and you're just going to stop. So that would be my, my first one. And again, don't forget that, as we've said before, it could be using OER, but it could also be um, looking for other ways of going open, like with library resources or just free web resources as well. So, Verena, do you want to finish off? Yeah, and I want to finish off that thought. So, um, instructors really need to think about they need to have a personal reason for doing this. 
don't just do it because you're being told to do it (laughs) or you think it's the best thing to do. Really, you have to have a personal connection because using an open textbook is one reason because of the cost, but you need that meaningful reason to transition and look at other content, find the time, because what I've noticed uh, with the instructors is once they find that time, um, that they don't think they have to take that um, step to look at that other content, their pedagogy changes, the way they are looking at student engagement changes. Um, And the other thing is it's not, it's really difficult to do this individually and really think about doing this collaboratively and who, who, who is out there to help you. And we've talked about librarians, but it might be, your colleague down the hallway. It might be students. Um, I'm thinking of an example. I'm working with chemistry professors right now. Um, Working together collaboratively has really helped um, not only change uh, the content and the resources to, to save students money, but it's changed the way the instructors are doing and thinking about learning, which is really exciting. Yes, I do agree. That is very exciting, Verena. And Uruj, would you like to add on to this? Sure. I love what was just said, by the way. I love the idea of collaboration that OER permits for. And just, it's, I'm thinking about all of the things I'm going to take back from listening to you speak about maybe organizing some sprints with faculty or with departments. Um, but the question, okay. So I think something that's really worked for, for us in the in the past little while, and I have to say, I've only worked at KPU during this pandemic. And so by highlighting lessons from the pandemic to get instructors to think about the challenges they faced with traditional commercial resources, I found has been very helpful. So thinking about supply chain issues that have been faced by students in the past few semesters, thinking about, you know, we have a large contingency of international students who were not able to be in Canada the past few semesters, and they were not able to pay for their commercial resources with the currencies where they're you know, where they're from because they don't have access to Canadian dollars and some publishers only accept certain currencies. So all these little issues really helped us pivot to think about how ZTC, OER and library license materials might be solutions to some of these problems. Um, So uh, the other one, you know, with this pivot online, um, there were so many anxieties that I, you know, empathize with around copyright and fair dealing and how to navigate all of that. So pivoting to open, um, I feel like it's a nicer, safer sort of um, sort of solution that we can discuss with faculty when there's so much change happening, when, you know, when you're teaching four classes and you have to navigate uh, fair dealing and you have to do a bunch of different things. Um, it's nice to offer solutions that are less onerous, that feel safer and feel manageable. And I think those have been very helpful in the in the past few months, at least, or maybe I can say past few years at this point. Yes, that is true. It is good to, to be open to change and to uh, respond to change. And I do agree with all the sentiments that have been shared thus far. Uh, but it, we've all uh, shared different versions of ZTC at our respective institutions uh, or what it doesn't look like uh, at our respective institutions. But I'd like to hear from all of us and uh, switch the conversation on to what, what comes next or what is next for ZTC at our institutions. We have reached great heights uh, or we are on the way to reaching great heights, but I'd like to see or hear more about what we think is coming up next or what would be next for institutions. And to kick us off, I'll ask Caitlin uh, to uh, get the ball rolling. Thank you so much. Uh, So as Sona said, we've just implemented a ZTC attribute in our timetable. Um, So our next step is to make the ZTC attribute searchable. Uh, So this means the attribute can be used to filter courses when students are browsing the timetable. Uh, Now, this is actually quite easy for us to enable in Banner, which is our student information system. So our main challenge lies in the data collection process. So since we want the attribute to be searchable, uh, it's important that the attribute is applied consistently so that this filter is producing accurate results. Uh, Now, there are quite a few complexities around aligning the data collection processes of ZTC use on campus. Uh, So, for example, uh, hiring timelines for faculty don't align with when the bookstore needs textbook information, which doesn't align with when our timetable would need that information about required course resources. 
Uh, so we are currently working with our schools and our administration to find ways to integrate this data collection process into the existing timetable processes. So we are hoping to enable this searchability for our 22-23 timetable, which will be published in this coming April. Uh, and in September 2022, so our upcoming September, we will be conducting a student survey to assess student perceptions and use of the ZDC indicator during registration. So we're hoping to find out more about how students are using the ZDC attribute in the timetable so that we can use this data to articulate the value of having the textbook cost information available in the timetable and that the impact this has had on our students. So we're really excited about our next steps at our institution. Thank you, Caitlin. I do hope it all goes well. I look forward to hearing uh, how this goes uh, for you at RDP. Uh, but yes, Urush, would you like to share what, what next, what's next for uh, your institution? Sure. So very similar. Um, you know, since we've partnered with the registrar on the ZTC attribute, we also have access to data dashboards through um, at our institution, it's called the Office of Planning and Accountability. And so these dashboards allow us to compare some interesting metrics between ZTC and non-ZTC courses. So things like enrollment, persistence, um, and performance measures for, for students. Um, so that's really interesting. And so we're working on creating a, a report for three complete academic years of what this data might look like. But beyond that, I think looking at the data it doesn't, it gives us some answers, uh, but it also, it, there are a lot more questions to be asked, you know, like why are there certain uh, trends in certain faculties? Um, you know, it helps us identify gaps, I think. So it's, it's, it's more than just saying, you know, if the program is successful or not successful, it really helps us ask other questions to push the program or open initiatives generally further. Um, so we're able to, for example, see which courses are using open educational resources and which are not, or which are not ZTC rather. And then we're able to, you know, do some work to see, okay, why is that? Is it because OER um, don't work for, for these classes for a particular reason? Um, so yeah, that in a nutshell is, is how we're using data and where we'd like to go and where we are headed. Thank you so much, Uruj, and that does sound exciting. But I'd also like to hear from Chetan. Uh, so you did mention that UFC has a very interesting uh, uh, point. Uh, is that a very interesting stage? Uh, so would you like to share what's next for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mentioned it before, and, and people have been jumping on this comment, um, which, which is great. Um, and it's the idea of like a top-down versus bottom-up um, implementation for open education and, and ZTC. Again, right now, we do have professors like at our university that care about open education, that want to implement this into their class. Some of them are even doing this right now. Um, but again, there's no directive, again, top down. That's kind of, you know, helping this whole situation along. So what's next for us is, again, from a student perspective, I think I can only talk about the things that I'm involved in. Um, but the student government, the students union at the U of C um, is putting together a working group of students that are passionate about um, open education and, and the implementation of ZTC um, and kind of getting together and, and brainstorming ideas where we can bring the idea of implementing a ZTC signifier program like again, through our, our class registration system and more of, again, like advocating for a top-down approach in terms of open education to like the registrar um, and university administration. So I think that's like a really, really big thing that like I'm involved in right now. But there's also like exciting stuff, like I mentioned with um, the new OER librarian that the UFC hired. I know that, um, I know that she's been like really, really involved with um, hosting sessions so instructors can learn more about open education and then ZTC. So there's a lot of exciting work happening. Um, I think that UFC is maybe a little bit behind of the other schools that like um, are, are at this panel, but I think all the places are like in place, all the steps are in place for the next like five or so years to be really, really, really exciting. And, and um, I guess a lot of work can be done in the next five or so years that'll really push the envelope for what we are at our school. Yes, and as a student, it is exciting to hear that there's a lot happening with the students at UFC, and hopefully, uh, sooner rather than later, we get to the to the dream that we're all looking forward to. Uh, but I'd also like to hear from Anne from Ryerson. Was there anything you can share about with us about what's next uh, for ZTC at your institution? 
I think that for us, we just have to revisit which programs. I'd like to do a scan of which programs are using e-reserve the most and which would be the next sort of target. I think I would revisit back um, the program that we tried because I do think that there's a possibility now that we that the chair is a bit more um, aware of open. And I think that... Um, Hopefully, we are hiring an OER librarian as well, and that may help um, with outreach um, and knowledge because I, I work in the area of open with another librarian quite closely, but we also have many, this is off the side of my desk, many other responsibilities. Um, so having that kind of focus, I, does, I do think it helps to have focus and people working in a particular area at an institution and um, having time to concentrate just on this one issue. But I think that um, ZTC in particular has a lot of connection with libraries because of the library resources that are there that can be used in courses. It's not just a textbook issue. And because of that, I mean, there's so many reading lists. I mean, um, I think that there's ways to approach affordability that may not always be an entire Z cred or Z cred as far as you can go within a program. So at least if it's you're not offering a Z cred, you're trying to offer as many um, free courses in a program as you can. Yes, and thank you so much. And uh, last but not least, I'd also like to hear from uh, Brenda from the, from Thompson Rivers. Is there anything you'd like to share with us about uh, what what uh, what's coming next for ZTC at your institution? I think I'm going to let Verena start on this one. We're a tag team. We're doing well, Brenda. <laughs> so the first thing I think that we really need to do is finish our Associate of Science degree pathway for ZTC. And as the lead on that, I'm so excited because I get to spend the next year finishing that up. Um, and then the maybe this is a big secret, but um, it's a really exciting secret that I want to share with everyone because we want others to join us. Um, we're building the OER community by partnering with Adapt LibreTex. And the reason I'm sharing this is because the number of instructors, especially in science, that have needed open homework systems to integrate with their press book, whatever, LaTeX, whatever they're using, is astronomical. And what they're creating with Adapt, remember, it's like the whole state of California creating this. So we're talking Western Canada right here or Canada North America. This is the whole state of California who's been putting money into this for their students. They've created a system that's kind of like Amazon that brings multiple repositories and open educational resources together. And it makes it a lot easier to create open educational resources that look like press books or integrated open homework systems. And so I'm bringing this up because this is where we got to as a result of doing the ZTC, um, ZTC sponsored support by uh, BC campus program. So we are the only ones in Canada doing this for, this far. And as Brenda writes, come join our party. <laughs> uh, um, we're also improving the data in the banner system. We totally agree. Our colleagues have said that it's better, but it's still not complete. Um, we have to map the courses on campus that are ZTC and look to see what program pathways they build in either full or partially. Um, it's also really neat to see that our open learning courses, because of the ZTC program, are integrating with our face-to-face uh, -face courses on campus. So all the work that we're doing with the ZTC courses um, are now being considered and adapted in some of our uh, departments, like our, our chemistry department. We're in the process of adapting and ZTC toolkit to meet TRU needs in multiple ways, and we're going to be sharing that out. Um, and we're marking our OL courses in Banner, but it has to be a different process than campus courses. So the whole marking in, in Banner and helping students figure out, is this a ZTC course or not, is actually a very difficult process. And we definitely need to spend some time and energy on that. Brenda, did I miss anything? I think you got most of it. So I think it's just actually right now it's just continuing to build and bringing more people into the conversation. And we're finding that we're getting more and more support. And I mean, there's been a huge increase in our number of uh, ZTC courses over the past year. Um, I think we've gone, I can't remember what it is, but like we, a massive increase over the past year from what we were doing for ZTC courses a year ago, as opposed to today or this year. 
um, because I do an inventory. I've been doing an inventory of every single course and mapping where data is available. Um, So I think it's just continuing to grow for us uh, and I'm looking for more partners, but I'm really excited about the LibreTech stuff. So I think it's going to be fun. But Verena, there was a question in the chat for you about um, how to enjoy this party. Well, I put my email, so you're welcome to just send me an email to join the party or follow me at Verena NZ on Twitter. Um, But the yes, anyone doing chemistry, a chemistry, everyone out there, you're the first to join the party. (laughs) I would say that's where the most work is being done. and, And really give me a shout if you're with chemistry. You're, you're an easy person to get in the door. <laughs> That's because, don't forget, LibreText used to be ChemWiki. So <laughs> there, there's a strong chemistry interest. Oh, that is. Uh, and thank you so much, Brianna from, and Brenda, for sharing this with us. I must admit, it's very exciting. And this now um, um, inspires my next question, which might be our last one, just in the interest of time. Uh, what is most exciting for you? Uh, or to you about ZTC. I know we've, we might have hinted to it in uh, a lot of what we've said so far, but I'd like to hear um, if, you, if you could identify what excites you most about ZTC at your institution. So to start us off, I'll ask you to uh, uh, get the ball rolling this time. Yeah, so ZTC is one of the pieces of our open ecosystem. And the really cool thing, and what sets it apart from our other open initiatives is that instructors here from open IKPU once a semester when we're trying to get those um, that attribute attached to their course section if they are ZDC. So at the programmatic level, it's unique because um, once a semester, something about open is always entering the inbox of every single instructor at KPU. And that just it's just a great opportunity to engage with anything around open. So oftentimes when I send out that email requesting folks to submit the web form, I'll get a bunch of questions around open, um, around you know, even if it's just what even is this program, um, it, it just starts a great conversation. And it's been really great to have that sort of direct connection with every single faculty member through the program. And I think I think it's like the the little opportunities that programs offer sometimes that are the the most interesting. Thank you, Rouge. Uh, what about you, Chetan? Uh, what excites you the most about ZTC? Yeah, again, I guess my answer will be coming from my perspective as a student. And that's just that, I guess, as far as I know, there are only benefits to ZTC. Sure, it takes a little bit of extra work on the behalf of librarians and professors, Um, But, you know, as far as I know, they've been very, very excited to do this work. For students, ZTC, it lowers your costs. It lowers the costs of education. Something that, you know, at least in Alberta and and I'm sure other provinces has only been going up in recent years. I'm kind of limiting access to education for for some people who who are, you know, not, who are, you know, disadvantaged in terms of like their financial situation or otherwise. And on top of that, every single like, I don't know, research article or, or every single perspective I've ever heard is that like ZTC and, and open education only increases like pedagogical effectiveness in classes. There's just so many like wins. It's just one win after another, after another, after another, that, that just like make up the entirety of open education and, and ZTC. So I guess there's nothing that isn't exciting about OER and ZTC, <laughs> at least from a student's perspective. We're not the ones doing all the work, so. Yes, I would. I would echo your perspective, Chase, and I do agree that there's, there's very little to see, or if any, that is not exciting about ZTC. Um, I'd like to turn to Anne from Ryerson as well. In your perspective, what excites you the most about ZTC? Um, I think that what excites me excites me the most is that it really um, signals to students the work that is being done to help them at the institution. So when you're course marking, I mean, we're not doing it yet, but it just is a dream of mine. When you're course marking and saying to students, look, this is these courses have all been impacted by faculty being concerned about textbook cost, and they have either transitioned to open education or trans- transitioned to an e-reserve course. I think it's... Um, it's a way that the university is showing care to the students that attend. So that's my most um, 
that's what makes me the most passionate. But I think just generally, it also um, is a way the library can really um, come forward in terms of making the resources that we do collect. Um, and not It's not so much the research focus, it's the educational and pedagogical and teaching focus that we can also, with ZCred, it's very unusual that a ZCred is completely just open educational textbooks. It's often also library resources, and it's, and it's maximizing the use of library resources that already exist, that we already subscribe to um, for teaching purposes at the university. Yes, and thank you. And um, hopefully this time I get the order right. But Brenda, would you like to share with us what's most exciting for ZTC or ZTC wise? I would agree with what Anne says um, and the others as well. I think the fact that it's making education more accessible is a huge part. I think it's showing that the institution recognizes that and that they're showing support and care for students. But one thing I also think is really exciting about it is the watching the pride of instructors as they're doing something different and interesting pedagogically, that they're learning something new and knowing they can do it just by sort of turning the way they teach on its head, by whether it's by, you know, engaging with um, OER and learning the skills to make those adaptations and changes, or whether it's just looking to use the library resources, they're actually changing how they think about teaching and re-engaging. And I think that's really exciting to watch. Thank you, Brenda. And last but not least, um, Sona, would you like to share with us what's most exciting for you about ZTC? Absolutely. I'll start off and then uh, Caitlin can finish off. But for um, for me, I think the most exciting thing, and it's been stated several times, is making education more accessible and really making it more affordable for students so that more uh, learners can benefit. And with our ZTC implementation in particular, making that cost of course resources transparent to the students. So Caitlin? Thanks, Sona. Uh, I'd just like to add that we're very conscious that historically education has only been accessible to the affluent, and that's really something that we are looking to, um, to address and correct and change in the ways that we as librarians can. Uh, and I really liked what Anne said about showing care. I think this is one of the ways that we are, we are able to show care to our students, and that's so important. That is true. I think care is a very good uh, uh, way to choose in this conversation. For my very last question, and very quickly, uh, for Uruj, would you well, would you say the benefits that come up come out of a ZTC program that go beyond what we see in terms of in a classroom setting, for example? Yes, I think you know um, what Caitlin and Sona just said is incredibly important. So I think about student agency and having the sort of being able to search for classes and make decisions based on the needs that you have as a student, I think is in incredibly powerful. It's a step towards sort of putting the, um, putting the power back in students' hands. Um, it's again, a small thing, but incredibly powerful if you, if you think about student choice. Um, so. Or if I phrase it this way, is there anyone on the panel that would like to pose a question to or contact us from different institutes? I'm curious about how the institutes are a different institute, the different institutions started. Um, now that Chayton's brought up the idea of this top down, bottom up, it got me thinking, how, how did this start at, at each institution? I think I know about Kwantlen, but maybe they could expand upon it a bit or, or Red Deer or... Yeah, how did it start for you? So everyone knows that it starts in different ways, I guess. And that is a very good question you asked, Verena. And very quickly, I'll start with uh, Rouge from uh, KPU. I have to unmute. Um, the, so I'm not always the best person to ask about the sort of institutional memory pieces because I still feel very new. But from what I understand it, it started with an environmental scan. And I think like many of us, people were doing open work before the top down institutional programmatic things were sort of brought in to support instructors doing that. Um, and so from what I understand at KPU, an environmental scan was done of folks using OER mostly OER, we weren't really thinking about the library licensed portion of, of what our ZTC program is, and bringing those instructors' um, work 
out um, into the public and getting the attribute associated with their course was how I think we began and then championing them. Um, and then the word spread because there's no advocate like a colleague. It's, you know, coming from us, it's, it's not the same as coming from somebody sitting in departmental meetings with, with their colleagues. Thank you, Ruj. And Keegan, would you like to provide the perspective from uh, right here? Uh, well, much like Rouge, I am uh, not the person to ask about the institution's uh, history, so I will throw this over to Sona. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, so similar to KPU, uh, we also uh, did begin with the requisite environmental scan. It's always great to see what other institutions are doing, uh, particularly, um, we, we checked all of Canada, but particularly Western Canada. And we did actually look quite a bit to KPU's information that we found um, with regards to the implementation of our ZTC attribute. Um, but it's definitely something that we've had conversations around over the past, um, prior to the pandemic, the past couple of years, um, about having some sort of indicator in our timetable. So uh, these things kind of just organically evolve, but it has taken quite a bit of time. It was an overnight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sunan. Oh, go ahead, Brenda. Oh, um, I was just going to say, for us, actually, TRU and KPU got a BC Campus grant when they first started having um, they had some grants for uh, BC institutions that were interested in developing a ZTC program. So TRU and KPU were two of the first to get those grants. And that's sort of what started us for really moving in that direction for it to be actual program-based. Um, but the models that we approached it have been quite different. Um, and we're sort of growing the ZTC part on campus right now. Open learning is much easier to build and to grow just the way the structure of how the programs work in open learning. Um, but for a lot of it has really been BC Campus provided a lot of support for us on it. Thank you so much, friend. And I think one thing we can all take away is that there's, uh, there's, def there's different ways to uh, reach uh, the same goal. Um, there's no one set, there's no set way and uh, we're working with whatever resources that are available for us, it is possible to make ZTC successful in different capacities at our various institutions and our various levels. So I'd encourage everyone here to continue thinking about ZTC and then making sure that this is the direction we move in. Um, at this point, I'd like to say thank you to all the panelists uh, for the amazing conversation, uh, the questions asked and the answers uh, offered. And I'd like to turn back the floor to Wiley. Once again, uh, thank the panelists for uh... I think an, an excellent discussion on, on zero textbook cost. Um, yeah, applause. Um, and also uh, I'd like to thank uh, Robel for excellent moderation. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, I think uh, one thing that, that I heard, I, I think Farina mentioned it earlier on was the effect of um, zero textbook cost on the on pedagogy and, and changing people's pedagogy. And I think that's an important piece to take away, at least from my side as an instructor. It's, it really does impact the way you think about your course and you teach your course. So that was um, uh, you know, a wonderful point. Um, so with that, I think um, we will we'll end this, conclude the session and um, hopefully see you all tomorrow. I believe I'm going to make sure that I'm not leading you astray, but yes, tomorrow morning um, to continue with uh, day three of, of what's been a, a wonderful symposium so far. So um, thank you all, and I uh, will see you tomorrow. <laughs>